Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, thanks also for sharing uh, the territories uh, where you are and, and where you've lived. I wanna start with acknowledging uh, that this event um, and many of our guests are coming from uh, traditional unceded territories. Uh, in our case, the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil tooth First Nations. I also wanna say as guests on this ancestral land, we meet tonight with gratitude and with respect. Thank you for joining us. I also wanna do a couple other thank yous before we start. Uh, thanks to the BC Association of Writers and the Vancouver Writers Fest for helping us spread the word. Uh, thanks for VCC Marketing for spreading the word within our community and for the VCC community um, in general. I also want to thank Event Lab, the production company with whom um, I am working, who uh, is sitting right beside me. We have people um, joining us from Ontario, from California, from Saskatchewan, of course, my homeland, from BC and from Alberta. So welcome um, to this event and thanks for coming. Um, at the, you know, roughly uh, within about 10 minutes or 15 or 10 or 10 or 15 minutes before eight o'clock, we're going to open um, a question and answer. And so please um, send your questions in the chat box to the moderator, and um, we will try to get to as many as we can by the end. So happy to be here and so happy to be welcoming um, the person we're all here to, well, here, um, a woman who's Honesty and strength have merged to create a, a new mythology, um, uh, something that includes eclectic stories that fuse spirituality and realism. She's a writer who intertwines Catholic and Indigenous symbols uh, and the Cree language and the history are elevated and, and reclaimed. So it's, it's, I'm very excited. Louise Bernice Half, Sky Dancer. Um, is our guest tonight, of course. Um, she's a woman who uh, has, has lived through residential school system, has flourished um, with uh, her, her craft and her writing. She's been honored with awards. She's been nominated for the Governor's General Awards. She's been Saskatchewan's Poet, Poet Laureate. And now um, she is Canada's Parliamentary Poet Laureate, uh, something that is such a great um, uh, role for uh, the first Indigenous author. So without further ado, I would love to welcome Louise Bernice Half, Sky Dancer. Hi, Louise, how are you doing? I'm good. good. Pardon me? I said, I thank you for having me on your show. Yes, thank you. Yes, it's been, uh, we talked a little bit before this and one of the things that we uh, as Saskatchewan people do when we meet if we're not in the same town or city is say uh, the traditional greeting. How's the weather out there? <laughs> How's the weather it's out cool. there? It's <laughs> cool. The snow has gone though. <laughs> it's getting there. <laughs> One yeah. of the things I, I really love about your writing um, is the honesty that you bring to it. You don't you don't hold back with um, your experiences and and what you've um, seen and how you've come through. Um, I'd lo love to talk about that a bit later, but I also want to thank you for letting us be part of this, the witnessing. Um, so Canada's parliamentary poet laureate. How do you see your role in this? Congratulations, by the way. Well, thank you. Can I come then again, uh, mm. which means thank you. Um, how do I see my role in it? Well, I have been really, really booked uh, since the announcement. Um, I've been very busy with all kinds of interviews and writing requests right across the country. And uh, I actually haven't even started my, my own programming for the position yet. Um, uh, and, and what I'd like to do is really highlight Native poets across the country from each province and uh, get them on site on a parliamentary uh, librarian uh, website. I, 
I, I can't do it myself, but they'll, uh, I'll uh, make the recommendations and I will may ask the poets if they are willing to um, select a piece of poetry that they would like the general public to uh, access and to read. And of course, all of their bios and written material will appear there as well. That's fantastic. With this weird Zoom world, are you ever actually in Parliament? Are you, is that actually a no. part of the world? No. Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. Yeah. In fact, tomorrow we'll start talking about possible travel plans, but uh, not yet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like a really interesting, you, you're sort of a curator for um, artists across Canada now. Is that yes, fair to say? Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm wondering, uh, Sky Dancer, how did you receive that name? What, what's the story behind that? Oh, that's a long story um let me just take you back a little bit we we mentioned the fact that i met my husband in kootenai plains back in 1973 i started having dreams about uh, my writing career when i was in my tw my 20s but i didn't understand i didn't understand the dreams till like 20 years later although i they, they were really very much part of my memory and um as I progressed in my maturity, I had to go back to my elders and honor those dreams. And they took me into ceremony and they assigned another dreamer to come up with that name. And so, but I won't go into the ceremony and, uh, but it was a vision quest and, uh, that I, and, I, and then I had to wait for a bit before the, the name was given to me. And it actually means much more than a, um, what the name implements or implies. Uh, I was named after the Northern Lights, but there's four levels of the heavens of which I have been granted to um, observe and to write from. And do you bring some of this into your poetry? The, the, yes, um, I do. The naming. Yeah, I do. Yeah. And in what parts of the poetry? I mean, uh, I do, I, well, because I have six books all together, like Bare Bones and Feathers was the first one, Blue Marrow. Uh, which is an epic poem, The Crooked Good, which is another epic poem, and then Burning in This Midnight Dream, and then Sugeta, which is a compilation of poetry uh, with, da with David Gardner, and then my own uh, recent book, Awasis. So it, it surfaces in, in, in different parts of those, those written works. It's a, it's a really interesting... Um mix, I think, of the characters you create. Well, it seems to me that you're creating some characters as well as um, building upon characters or um, sort of existing mythology in Indigenous uh, myth mythology. Is that, is that fair to say as well? Uh, so I, I, I think so, yeah, yeah. So I, I, one, one person or one character I had in mind was Nokum the medicine bear. Um, mm -hmm. that was that is that based on a, um, an existing story or is that a one that you created? Uh, Nukum the medicine bear is is actually one of my grandmothers who I perceive as um, a huge woman who has the capacity for medicines and for healing and uh, yeah. I, I love that poem it, it I well we um won't be able to read it tonight, but when you're writing, do you have an audience in mind or are you sort of just writing? Well, I, I don't pay attention to the idea of audience. If I did that, I would all right away start censoring myself and accommodating others. And that's not my journey. If my journey is to share the story and allow people to enter it and find themselves however which way they want to define themselves um, and to um, hopefully uh, shed some light into the culture and, and into my community. Yeah, exactly. Well, one of the things that is so powerful is you intersperse um, Cree language and ceremony and tradition and uh, a sort of, you know, the, the sort of, um, other religious sort of iconography and symbolism as well, just so smoothly. And I, I was wondering, 
is that intentional? Is that um, something that that just comes naturally, or is there um, a purpose? I think it just comes naturally, but I do think about I do think about how I want to insert cre. I mean, I made up of all of that stuff, right? I mean, it's part of my whole uh, being. I mean, I, I grew up on a reserve in a log shack, right? And, and mm -hmm. people would perceive us to be living in poverty. I never thought of it as poverty. Uh, and then I went to residential school for about six, seven years. and uh, But that was broken up. In my time in residential school was broken up. And then I went back. And, and then I went into the, into the town of St. Paul to do some... Um, some of my educational training and then I left it went to a different community so I mean I'm made up of all, all kinds of things like everybody else so you you bring these threads of yourself into the poem but but people also need to be aware that every writer brings themselves like a frank about this much of themselves and the rest is creating um from the imagination and pulling from all kinds of um Oh, pulling from all kinds of the uh, atmosphere, so to speak, you know? Yeah, the experiences that you've lived, the, the sort of um, your family, the traditions, the language as well. That was something that I, I was kind of curious about as well is um, with the experience of the residential schools, does that continue to linger? Does that still continue to influence your writing? Uh, at the moment, I'm not allowing it to because been there, done that. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, I, I don't want to go back there. But in terms of, um, I am reminded constantly about where I come from and what colonization has done to me. And at times, I'm overwhelmed with bitterness. There's no doubt about that. And I really have to work to get beyond that because I can't function that way. I'm not generally a bitter person. I can let things go but I'm a human being. So I do have to honor the, those thoughts and those feelings and, um, and go, oh yeah, yeah, that happened. You know? That's part of the joy of getting older, right? As we start to be able to um, say, okay, you're done. I don't need you anymore. I don't need this anymore. That's part of this, this journey of, of getting older as well. Um, I know that you do um, walks across uh, Southern Saskatchewan sometimes. I look at those, I've told you this already, but I look at those, uh, I, I would, I love the idea. I want to do that sometime um, as a pilgrimage. Do you, is, is that a part of making sense of the world that the literal quietness of walking without a car, without? Um. One of the things that I make very clear when I go on these walks is that I have to put history aside, okay? I cannot get in, I cannot get caught up with all the horrible things that have taken place in this country. I, I walk to appreciate the land, its beauty, its environment. I walk to appreciate my fellow walkers and to know them as human beings and to really appreciate the spirit of the land. I remember after walking from um, uh, Murloc, Saskatchewan to, um, uh, Gravelberg, and I've walked long distances before, but not for days. And this was for days and days. And I was hired in a kite for three days. I thought when I came home and I was sitting, I'm going, what's the matter with me? Why, why am I sitting still? I, I want to go back on that walk. You know? <laughs> so I, I look forward to these walks. You know, Saskatchewan is incredibly beautiful. Um, oh, and, I know. And, and, I, you know, I, I yeah. I still consider myself, um, you know, Saskatchewan's my homeland. There's, I mean, obviously the skies are magnificent, but just mm -hmm. the, the simplicity, you know, the, it's not all flat. There are, no. you, you kind of see the history, you know, in places like, I know Fort Capel, you've been to Cypress Hills. You see that those were rivers in yeah. a long, long time ago. There's something yeah. really amazing about that. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Well, in like in, uh, in Northern Saskatchewan, um, there's sand dunes, miles of sand yes, dunes yes. in some of those lakes, you know? And last year after that walk, we went on, uh, or is it before? I think before the walk, we went on a week long canoe trip way, way up North. Oh, uh, Lac La Ronge uh, by chance? 
Yeah, uh, yeah, we went through La Ronge, but we were further north than that. Oh, and wow. uh, it was fantastic. I, and I'm not a canoeist, I'm a, I'm a land person and I'm petrified of water. I'm not yeah. a great swimmer, <laughs> but, but I loved every minute of it. I mean, I, I, I'm serious, I was so scared, but I, I'm not gonna do it again. You're not gonna do it again? That didn't make you emboldened? No, no, I'm doing it again. Oh, you are doing it again. Yeah. Yeah. How, yeah. how do you deal with that fear? I mean, to me, you know, I'm an English lit, instructor so i always think of the bigger you know what does that mean deep down but but the dealing with the fear of the water because i'm afraid of water as well um but you do it anyway and and yeah. this is emblematic of, of the bigger picture i think too of embracing that fear yeah yeah well one year when my husband and i went canoeing up north uh, and i was petrified of some of the rapids i we actually jumped in the rapids with our our, our life jackets and I hung on to him as <laughs> we went down the rapids. <laughs> and I and, and that was the only way I could conquer some of that fear. But I don't uh, but I don't like rapids. <laughs> no, I bet he doesn't like them anymore either. <laughs> but he's a better swimmer and a better canoeist than I am. Oh. You know? yeah, yeah. Where are you going canoeing next? Uh we're going to uh, fly into uh, uh Paul Paul River. Oh yeah, the BC Paul River and and work our way to the Churchill uh, River system. Oh, beautiful! Jeez, you're bold. I can't even imagine doing something. Hey, like listen, that. this is nothing. Do you know what? Uh, to even though it's scary, I think sometimes people are scarier than the environment. People. Oh, for sure. Oh yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so that I think before um, we actually started, you were talking about just a bit of your history and um, meeting your husband in the bush and that sort of thing. But that was that was a place that you escaped to, right? When you were feeling yes. overwhelmed, nature, and you can really see that. That's another part of your poetry I love is nature is just part of the world. It's it's not just you go to nature and then you come back in. It's just embedded so deeply in the characters and it seems your your point of view generally. Well, if you really think about it, we are nature, right? I yeah. mean, uh, science and my people, my people have always said, uh, the elders have always said, we come from the stars. And it took me a while to figure that out. And then, and then I discovered that we all have come from the stars. We're made of nitrogen, yeah. oxygen. What else are we? All those, there's five chemicals that have make up those stardust, right? And that's what we are. We are stardust. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, 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 I had a, a bit of an epiphany about that a few years ago. And I thought it was just so comforting you know, just to know we're all the same, right? And also that makes it more frustrating that we still have these barriers and that sort of thing. Um, you know, we the, the sort of made up things that we say, well, I don't like you because of this, or yeah, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's something, it, it's a really good reminder. I see that in your poetry as well. Speaking of your poetry, I would love it, we would love it, if um, you read um, a section from uh, Blue Marrow. So just in terms of the context for the audience who may not be familiar with this, um, Blue Marrow is um, what we English lit people call an epic poem, <laughs> a poem that is a story and a story that um, is woven, is interwoven from the beginning to the end um, with sort of similar, anyway, I'll shut up. Who cares what I think? Uh, just please read, Louise. <laughs> I receive a rock in the mail. Hummingbird sends a wing. I barricade myself. My figures, crows, ravens, a computer, Quebec, referendum. I sip, Ukkani, chew, we guess. Notes slip under my throat. Oh, oh, no slip under my door. I can hardly get past my throat. Large white splatters at the house, feathered people storming. Columbus wrote, my wound has opened again. His bones at the Cathedral of San Domingo move four times 
different burial grounds. In a last move, his ashes spill and are trampled. Possession took me last night. I slept with the bone, the jawbone of elk lined, elk lined with pearly teeth. I bathed her in sweet grass, laid her under my pillow. Winds swept through me. This path has chosen me. This chosen walk is a blizzard whiteout, my cream alone in the heavy arm of snow. I hang on to this bone dressed in satin, weighed in redberry lakes. I am married to her garden of carrots and sweet corn heads. I lay her skull, broken jaws, face them to the east. When Newcomb's granddaughter slept on top of graves, I thought she was crazy. All night I danced above her head. She dragged a string of skulls, heavy in torrent rains, creeing loud into my night. I sleep with rocks too. I couldn't say this before. Who could I say it to except Newcomb's granddaughter? The rocks fill me. Their stories, slates, and dreams heavy in my stomach move like thick clouds blown by my labored breathing. I cannot catch them. I don't think to ask them to slow down. I sleep with petrified wood too, frozen snails, snakes with amber eyes, crystallized tails. Soon the black robes will burn me, stake me to their cross, I won't have to live in White Oaks much longer. Benny, that's wig Nukumak, climb down my grandmother's. Come heal us. <coughs> the thick fog, the fog has lifted, the ice scattered. The fire burns, we have built the fire. The crossing of the roads is where we wait. Benny, that's wig Nukumak. Climb down, my grandmothers. Come heal us. Your medicine is so powerful. We need for our healing. Climb down, my grandmothers. In your gentleness, pity us. Bless me, Father, I pierced my flesh, dance with the sun, bathe my face in blood. I didn't mean to. Forgive me, Father, I ask for absolution. I promise to say my rosary and serve my time. I promise to keep my hands to myself and swallow my tongue. Amen. Wow. Wow. That, that's amazing. And it, it's so great to see... You know, we had the visuals as well. So great to see the language. So, so why is it important to intersperse the Cree language? And, and pardon my ignorance, but um, are the words in the Cree language, are they what you are repeating or is, is that another? Um, they're literally translated into English. If we took each word apart, I could write you probably two, two pages of that translation, okay? Because not only would I write the words, I'd say the words, but I need to research it with my elders so that I get, there's always uh, legends and stories behind each word. Um, so, and I do it purposely because what I am a reader of, and I'm an avid reader, and I've come across a lot of literature that has German or Italian or Latin, or Latin inserted into the a novel or a story or research, and there's no translation. So I use the same rules that white people use in their writing. I figure if they can do it, I can do it too. <laughs> Of course. Well, language, that, that really kind of highlights that language is so important. It's so instrumental. And that's what, what really, you know, makes the experience of this weird assimilation that the residential schools were doing. Not weird is such an understatement, but the horror of that, of trying to um, kill the language of the instinctual language. It's tied into that. So is that part of well, you know, uh, one of the things 
um, that I have learned and I've come to appreciate, you know, the word psyche, mm -hmm. right? You know, the word psyche, which means soul and wind and spirit. And, um, and the other word is pagan. And pagan actually means at the hearth, H-E-A-R-T-H, -E right? It's at the fireplace. And so we learn about our spirituality by, uh, uh, on our mother's knees by the fireplace. And that's where we learn language as well. Yes, exactly. And again, this, this is part of that, the, the ancient ceremony, this intuition, right? And mm -hmm. um, you spend some time um, kind of focusing on women uh, in your poems um, and the, the, the traditions that they carry and, and both literally uh, pass on with children, um, but also spiritually pass on. Is, is that something that you've, um, oh, my cat, sorry. <laughs> My cat's getting everywhere. Is that something that you um, are, are conscious of doing? Is it is it something that is a, a part of messages that you convey? The the sort of matriarch, the the, the power. Oh yes. Um, well, you know, um, one of the things that drives me is that uh, there's been a lot of focus from a male perspective, not only. In, in white society, but in our society as well. And I really feel strongly that we women have to step forward and make ourselves much more vocal. And uh, because a lot of our, our story sharing has been, um, I'm going to say traumatized, but uh, uh, I don't think that's the right word. But and I, and I want to swear a little bit here, but... No, <laughs> feel free. No, I'm, I'm I've been free. holding back this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but our stories have been um, really screwed up by the churches and by male perspective, by the male thought. And I'm going, uh, excuse me, we have our own way of perceiving and seeing, and we're going to show you how that's done. So uh, I'm very conscious about the female voice and our strength. And as I learn from my elders, the more I'm convinced that is where life begins all the time. I mean, not only at birth. Yeah. 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 And and why is it, do you think that that this sort of patriarchal um, dominance continues? You, you would think that by now. Well, we're all good students, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, We've learned a lot from residential school and we've, we've colonized ourselves and now we have to decolonize ourselves and going, you know, there's a really different way of perceiving and, and, um, and it's time to change those ways and thoughts. And um, I, mean, I mean, we're inheritors of everything where we inherit attitudes and behaviors from our parents and then we pass on that inheritance to our children. And so we have to make those conscious changes. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you feel like um, there seems to be in the sort of zeitgeist, um, a, a maybe transformative change going on right now, um, just with the recognition um, I, don't, I don't know if you you see yourself as, uh, you know, being the, the poet laureate. Do you feel a weight as, as you now are the voice or is that a freedom that you uh, are someone that people, well, someone who people continue to listen to? I, I, I don't know. I haven't spent any time thinking about that, but I, I am I'm thrilled to have been given this platform to, um, uh, advocate for poets because we are at the bottom of the genre of you know of any written literature right and we're the lowest paid people on this planet and people don't know that how much energy we, we put in uh, a poem I yeah. mean it could go through all kinds of and it's not only just writing it it's this research it's the contemplation it's it's it's, it's, it's really a, uh, you've got to love and be passionate about uh, your chosen work and um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, because I, I know, I don't know too many poets, but I, I do know a couple who will not move ahead with the poem until they find the exact 
perfect word. There's the efficiency. And to me, I mean, again, this is why it's so great to talk to you is there's an efficiency in poetry that we don't see necessarily in novels, which are great, of course, or plays, but there's something just so concise with the fewer words. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's an unrest or it should be respected more, but uh, yeah. this is part of, of Well, you know, it's um, when you think about poetry, and I think one of the greatest poets is, is um, Leonard Cohen. Ah, uh, yes. What do you like you about know, his poetry? I, oh, I love his poetry. <laughs> he is so heartfelt and, and he can get that message across with just a bare minimum of words in one little sentence. It's so profound. Exactly. Yeah, another icon for sure. Um, do yeah. you think, um, you know, kind of speaking of education and, the, you know, we all are good students. It's a really interesting way to say that. Um, what is the role, do you think, of educators? Do you think we're doing it right? Um, you know, with, with introducing, you don't know every educator, but what is our role in, in terms of educating the youth? Uh -huh. I want to mention two professors that I had that really made a big difference in my life. And then I want to talk about the education that I got from my elders. And maybe first I'm going to honor my elders and tell and uh, share with you uh, what how they've educated me. It's through example, mm. not so much as telling, but through example. Right. And, uh, and telling me that it's up to me it's up to you and, and, and sharing with me that intelligence is here, intellect is up here, and that's the longest journey ever. And, uh, but I could go on and on about my elders and their great teachings. The other two people that really influenced me in my, in my uh, life as professors was Professor Ron Markham, who's uh, retired now and he uh, um, lives in Victoria. And he introduced me to such profound literature when I was taking his class. And uh, that really turned my life around in terms of, uh, like I didn't grow up with literature and it certainly wasn't um, something that was nurtured when I was at home or at residential school. The time that the nuns captivated my attention is when they read a novel and they would stop at a chapter and then that was auditory, right? That was oral literature for me. And that was great. The other professor is Professor um, Hayden. I forget his first, his first name, Professor Hayden is how I knew him, but he was a history professor. And what, even though I was uh, fascinated by what he did, I didn't retain that information, but what he did was he brought actors into the classroom of those particular eras that he was teaching. It was fantastic. What made it so great having the actors come in? It was history in action, ah. you could see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm curious about what, um, what novels the nuns allowed you to read. Uh, there was um, uh, the Sheila Watson. The Double Hook. Oh no, I'm not familiar with that one. Okay, uh, The Inheritors, and I forget who the uh, uh, um, I forget who the uh, author was up, and the other was uh, Evan Bolin, uh, A Kind of a Scar, and that was a a poet from um, uh, uh, from Ireland. Oh, that seems progressive for the convent. <laughs> No, no, that oh, the, was in the, the convent. Sorry, sorry, no, no, no I, that was at university. No, oh, I uniform. don't remember. I don't remember the particular um, um, no, uh, novels or stories that the nuns told. I just remember being captivated by, oh, there's a story coming on, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Would, is that something you grew up with before Oral you were? tradition, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and so before you were ripped out of your home, was that already embedded within? Your family, mm -hmm. you were already yeah. told this because you were taken at seven years old. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And how was it when you came back? Was, was that part of uh, your family continued with that? The, the sort um, of oral tradition? 
I, I wish that I could say it did, but uh, there was, you see, both my parents were residential school survivors as well. So they were doing the best they can they could to uh, uh, share with us what they knew. But it really, residential school really fragmented my family. Yeah, of course, of course. And and this is, I think, something that um, those people, people who haven't experienced that don't recognize is that this doesn't stop when you leave the school, right? This is generations that continue yeah. with that. Yeah. So what, what sort of world do you see your grandchildren living in or what what sort of world do you hope they will inherit inherit i guess oh you know uh my son lives he's a physician in northern ontario he he flies out to um to the cree communities to provide service for them uh mm -hmm. my the eldest grandson is just finishing medical school at mcmaster Wow. And the other grandson is just finishing, uh, well, he's um, in his second year, I think, at McGill in uh, computer sciences. I, uh, when they were growing up, I tried really hard to pass on uh, some of the ceremonies. And they're really, um, they really embrace their native identity. Uh, but they, they're, they're going to have to pursue it now themselves. I mean, I can only do so much. I mean, they're in their 20s, right? And, you, mm -hmm. and it's up to them now. So I hope they come around. My, my grandson, the one that lives in PEI, the four-year-old, is highly influenced by his mother because I, I introduced my, 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 my daughter to ceremony at a very young age, and she's carried it on. And um, so she's teaching the little guy how to smudge, how to pray yes. with, with yeah. sweet grass and, and, and smudge, and, and how to honor the grandfather rocks, for example, the grandmothers, the grandfather rocks. And, and he prays every night with his mom. And, and my daughter makes a real effort to speak the, the little Cree that she has retained because she lives so far away, it's hard to maintain that, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing, actually. And like you said, the advice you were given, that that we need to take control of that that we we are the ones who can learn and and continue to teach but integrate it as well so there's something really nice about that concept mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i'm not sure if we are ready for questions are there some questions that we have okay um one thing we'll we'll get to those shortly um something else I, I wanted to um, ask is, well, first of all, your new book is coming out soon before we, before I get off track. Um, tell us about that. Kinky well, and disheveled. Know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at Alana's uh, name right now and she has she and her whatever pronouns. Yeah. Okay. In my community, in my language, we don't have pronouns. Oh, the okay. okay. We don't have pronouns, and we and if we're talking in English, we just use them interchangeably. Doesn't matter what sex you are, right? Right. So, uh, but with the, the with Awas is what I I just assigned whatever pronoun was telling that particular story, and Awas is actually means two things. It's not only refers to the child. But it also means the spirit which we are all loaned. And uh -huh. um, this particular awas is, is the adult child within. Okay. Yeah, and we okay. forget how to laugh as children, as adults. We forget the funny things that have been just hilarious to ourselves. And uh, so awas becomes the, um, uh, the character of all of these. Um, of all of these little stories that I've collected, and 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 her companion is the observer who, who stands by and says, "Look at what Awasis is doing next," you know. But the other thing I wanted to stress um, is the word Waguhtun. Okay, Waguhtun actually is means loosely relationship, but. It's much more than relationship. It means the place where I'm illuminated with and I bring it into the energy in this relationship. I have energy in this relationship. Okay. 
Yeah. yeah that, sorry, I'm just, I'm wrapping my head around that. Can you say that again? I want to, I want to really hear that. Okay. So it has two meanings. Like wa, wa mm -hmm. is means dawn. Um, wa guftun, it also means I'm walking in a, um, a crooked bend over way with my relatives. So you bring all of this, these two words together and you're bringing energy into the relationship. Any word that ends with win in my language is filled with energy. Okay. That's really interesting. It's such a, such a different way. I grew up Roman Catholic, uh, long since I lost that, but it's such a different way of thinking about, well, energy, rather than the submission to something higher, it's something mm -hmm. that's around. And, and again, it's, it's always, like, yeah. Yeah. Energy is always with us. Yeah. yeah. And then the power is within you rather than, um, you know, being given the power. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's something really amazing about that. Um, yeah. I think we have a question. I don't want to um, ignore questions. Well, this, okay. It's a, it seems that Cree language offers a more complex world. For you. It really, really does. And it says, how long did it take you on your writing journey to think of yourself <laughs> as a writer? Thank you for taking this on, Louise. I have to put my glasses on to read. So not only are you <laughs> saying the questions, but please answer as well. <laughs> well, I've been writing for over 30 years. So um, how long did it take me to perceive myself as a writer or a poet? I think I was just shocked when Bare Bones and Feathers was uh, published and I thought, Oh my God, I've got a book. <laughs> and uh, and then um, I was told, this is interesting, after Bare Bones Feathers was published, I was told it's probably the only po a book you'll ever publish, right? Who told and, you that? I'm not telling. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it was a white person. Of course. It wasn't <laughs> Margaret Atwood, was it? <laughs> No, in fact, Margaret was very good to me, oh, yeah. but um, uh, I, I, I took that as a challenge. I took it as a challenge rather than a put down. And, but each book has been difficult to write. It's, it doesn't come easily to me and um, uh, it's, it's a challenge. And I'm going, after a wasis is done, what in the world am I gonna write next? You yeah. know, so. So how do, how do, you, do you just let that sit and then it comes to you eventually? You trust that it's going to happen? I trust that it's going to happen. But if a subject interests me, I become possessed by it and I become obsessed by it. Yeah. And then I know that I'm supposed to be doing it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Louise, uh, can you ask another question of yourself <laughs> in the chat? Can't see those. No, okay. Let, can't see the sorry. Let me, can I see the next one? Uh, do you, do you oh. Chat oh, sorry. I have to go into this. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Do you have any specific, who's this from? Okay, doesn't matter. Um, do you have any specific Indigenous authors or storytellers who were your mentors? Part one. Secondly, who were, well, let's start with that one. No, I didn't have any mentors that, that were poets. Yeah, I, I was going to ask that question too. Good job, no. whoever asked that question. So no, no. did you think it was like looking back, did you think you didn't need them anyway? Or do you wish that you had them? Doesn't matter, I guess. Right? You know, I, I don't know, but I wish I had them. Um, it was probably a good thing that I didn't have them because it allowed me to develop my own style of writing and to find my own voice. Therefore, I wasn't influenced by anybody. Uh. However, when I was 16 or 15, I heard on the radio that they wanted uh, um, an essay written on, um, maybe I was even 14, on the Vietnam War. And um, I, wrote, I wrote an essay and I sent it in. And um, of course I didn't win anything, but I, I, I was surprised to receive this book in a mail that, that, and that book really left an impression for me. It was the first time I had ever seen a native book. And it was called, mm. simply called 
I am an Indian. Mm -hmm. It was an anthology of native writers. And, uh, and I remember the name that sticks out for me because he's still alive is Duke Redbird. Oh. And I think that book is still around, but I, I don't know for sure. And what was the time period of that? Like in the... That, that would have been um, probably... probably uh, late 60s, early 70s. Okay, so that was, yeah, I, I don't think there probably was a lot of um, Indigenous writers that no. were published, and there probably were a lot of writers, but weren't published at that time. No, 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 there wasn't. Yeah, and Maria speaking... Campbell was, Maria Campbell was the one who broke the ice, really. Really? Yeah. Mm. That's something to read. Second part of this question, still on the same topic, um, who are some current Indigenous authors and poets that you love or that we should be reading in uppercase capital letters now? Oh. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm actually making a list of all these Aboriginal writers. And um, Interestingly, one of the poets that I'm really appreciating right now is very gentle poetry is by um, Overt Mercury. He was a politician, he was a chief. He was the chief of uh, uh, the Assembly of First Nations, a very gentle man. Um, and I can't think of anything offhand because that's, a, I mean, I, I always have a list of people in front of me, but. Um, for sure. It's, yeah, that's a tough question to answer for sure as well, just off the top. But, but I mean, we'll be looking out to see what you are sort of recommending as we follow your role in all of this. Um, yeah. The, the, the sort of, as we sort of ease out of this, um, where do you see, I, I'm often curious about, um, you know, who we look back at, for example, residential schools or other, uh, you know, um, hate crimes against gay men and women we look back and think how could people ever think that you know like it seems so obvious it's such an awful thing do you think that we're we're doing anything now that we're going to look back and go oh my god it's so embarrassed to a, a culture or a race or a gender yeah. i know that's a bit of a yeah broad question uh I don't know how to answer that question because I think, I think uh, for myself, I know that when I reflect on my own journey and the mistakes that I've made, it's really hard to shed some of those um, unkind things, I suppose, that I've done to others, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if that's Catholic guilt because I went to a Catholic residential school. Or, or, or because some of the principles that I've learned, I've come to learn to and appreciate in my culture, um, suggest that I, I need to live a better life or whatever, you know. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I think sometimes the guilt can influence, yeah, sort of how we see um, what we're doing and, and that sort of thing. Um, so just before we go. Um, I'm going to see any more questions. No, no. Oh, oh, this is another question I was going to ask. Um, how do you feel this pandemic has affected the arts and culture fabric of our country, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, a pandemic? Well, in spite of the uh, pandemic, I, I think in spite of it, uh, We've been bubbling all over. I think for artists, um, it gives us time out to focus on our art. We, we, it, it, and it doesn't matter whatever genre you're doing. Perhaps like the potter is 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 exploring other ways of making dishes or or sculptures mm -hmm. or something like that. It it is given us the time out for reflection, and um, I. I because I live, I, I've, I've been, I know how to live alone, okay? I mean, my husband and I live together, of course, naturally, but uh, I live in a country and I've spent a lot of time alone. I'm totally comfortable, pandemic or no pandemic, you know? <laughs> so, you know, um, I do feel badly for those people who don't know how to live with their silence 
And it must be difficult for those people who have children who have to be at home and supervising those children and helping them with their school. And I feel badly about a lot of people who are whose health is a really bad situation. Like I, I have a, um, some relatives who are seriously ill right now and I can't see them. I can't go to Alberta to see them. Yeah. You know, yeah. so there's pros and cons to it, but it is a teacher nonetheless. It is a teacher for reflection and for contemplation and for seeing how we can create with this time that we've been given and how to mature ourselves. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think there's something about, I don't know if you feel like um, we're all in it together, you know, we're all forced to, to deal with the quietness and so on. Mm -hmm. But also we're forced to do Zoom things now. I was terrified yeah. of Zoom uh, and but we've adjusted it still. There, there's a sort of naturalness to it as well. Um, and mm -hmm. lots of people are seeing their seeing their families through Zoom virtually and, and that sort of thing much more. I, I think there is something really cool about being able to explore new things that you probably wouldn't have otherwise, right? That's right. Yeah. 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 Uh, Louise, it's been such a great honor speaking with you and good luck with the promotion and you'll be awesome with in this role. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. You've been great. You've Fellow, been great, Larry. Thank you. You, you too. Saskatchewan. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay. Good night. Good night. <laughs> thank you.